Hi. My name is JC McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and, and you're, you're watching, watching AccessTV.org. I think in the interest of time, we're going to go on and get started. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Mark Jenkins. I am the executive director of the Greater Hartford Harm Reduction Coalition. Uh, and welcome out to this community forum uh, in conjunction with Hartford Health and Human Services. I know the heat is, is unbearable so that you or the fact that you all uh, suffered through it to get here, you know, thank you. Uh, your presence is much appreciated. Um, we are going to have a very open dialogue <clears throat> tonight. Uh, really, you know, just uh, open, open it up for questions right off the bat. We're going to introduce our panel. Uh, there are a lot of other individuals in the audience that I, you know, I'm sure we'd love to hear from. I see Peter Canning is here. Uh, they've been working on some, some great initiatives, gathering data around the opioid overdose at present. Uh, Maria. Kooten Skinner is here. Did I say that right, Maria? That's, that's pretty good. All right. <laughs> it was with the Litchfield Opioid Task Force. It's the Litchfield County Opioid Task Force. And she's also the director of the McCall Center up there. Did I get that one right? All right. Ben, great to see you. Marsha Dufour. Just many others that, that are here would, you know, say thank you. I'd like to introduce, just really get right into it, and then uh, we'll just go back and forth, but, and have them introduce themselves uh, from left to right. You know, just give, you know, an introduction of yourself, what it is you do, and uh, let everyone know who you are. If you, if you don't know this first gentleman, Dr. Heimer, Robert Heimer, is just probably one of, I, I'm going to pull the strings. He's just one of the most, he's one of the smartest guys, you know, I, I know, and definitely the, one of the most informed of the different aspects ar around this whole disease, uh, hep C, HIV, the epidemic. And uh, without further ado, I'll, Robert. Well, thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, uh, you know, in 1990, we, the state first allowed syringe exchange, and I was one of the people fortunate enough to do the evaluation of that uh, back then. It seems like a lifetime ago, and it probably is. Um, and the successes of that kind of work should not be underestimated. At that time, there were about 500 new HIV diagnoses and drug users every year. The last couple of years, there have been 12 and 15. So that's a 95% reduction in, in HIV. That's remarkable success. We, it'd be fabulous when we do the same thing for opioid overdoses. We've been, we've been tracking this now, working with the state medical examiner with data since 1999 or 98. Um, it went up for a while. Then it went down for a while and stabilized. And then as uh, the federal government stepped in and started their um, supply reduction efforts on, uh, uh, on pharmaceutical opiates, all of a sudden the number of opioid overdose deaths went up again uh, as people turned from pharmaceutical opiates to heroin. And then, of course, more recently, as fentanyl has replaced or, or been added to heroin, we've seen another massive increase. How we're going to respond to that, I guess that's the topic what we're going to talk about tonight. So we'll introduce the next speaker. Good evening. My name's Christy Knowles. I'm an associate director of Wheeler Clinic's community-based services. I oversee multiple in-home services, um, specifically addressing substance abuse. 
Um, most recently, in reference to the opioids, um, we have a grant that we were able to do with our multidimensional family therapy program that services adolescents and young adults up to age 21, and will also provide medication um, assisted treatment as needed, which is also new uh, to the state of Connecticut being able to service adolescents in that capacity, um, along with primary care and um, uh, case management services, we also, through this grant, are able to follow the adolescent post-discharge up to a year to be able to help in providing any additional case management. Um, if they relapse, being able to support them in finding services and connecting them to resources in the community. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. need a mic, do I? Um, my name is Beresford Wilson. Um, currently, I am the executive director of the statewide multicultural family support organization known as FAVOR. FAVOR provides advocacy and support in the areas of juvenile justice, child welfare, and special education. Our primary program is a family peer support program that pays attention to special education. Um, if any of you are touched by a child that um, as a behavioral health or mental health diagnosis, you know how opioid abuse and use can exacerbate um, that, that issue. Um, I'm a lifelong Hartford resident. Um, I can share with you some of my um, exposure to um, opioids. Um, you know, I'm here, sitting here, and representing a statewide organization, but growing up in Hartford has exposed me um, to certain things, and I've never um, considered myself to be an angel, especially in my past. Um, so um, I have some lived experience that I could share with you and um, possibly respond to some questions. 86% um, of my staff, 27 um, women that um, work for Favor, uh, are individuals with um, lived experience. He needs to be on the mic. All right. Uh, uh, individuals with lived experience, um, meaning that um, they have and they are caretakers of children or individuals with behavioral health, mental health um, diagnosis, and some of those diagnoses um, involve um, uh, drug uh, addiction. Last but not least, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Roxanne Ellis Denby. I am a licensed clinical social worker and I currently work full time for the state of Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. I've been a state employee for over 20 years. Um, prior to coming to DEMIS, I worked in the Department of Corrections as a correctional nurse in the early 90s. And then um, once I finished my degrees in social work, I became a clinical social worker. My experience um, in nursing primarily, I worked for um, Phil at the Harvard Dispensary, and I took on that role as a nurse because I, even though I grew up as a resident in Hartford, I was not exposed to substance use. Like, I knew about marijuana, but that was it. And I would find doing my intakes when I, you know, on a Friday night, people were coming in from court and they were withdrawing from heroin and alcohol, cocaine, and I'm like, okay, what's going on? And I had no knowledge of it, so I took on the role as a nurse per diem, and I worked for the dispensary as long as, yeah, probably as long as I worked in the correctional setting. I just left early this year. Um, so a lot of my work has been with working with individuals with dual diagnosis. Um, in my nursing experience, I worked with individuals who had co-occurring diagnosis of hepatitis C and HIV, and I was part of a study um, where we did direct observe medication therapy for individuals who were, had a history of non-compliance um, with their HIV medications, and we saw progress. Um, and that study went on for a couple of years with the dispensary. Um, so my knowledge in, in, you know, substance, in the substance arena really prepared me for my work as an outpatient clinician. I have clients that have severe mental illness. I have clients that have 
the severe mental illness, and also the addiction component. So I do a lot of education. Some of my clients are infected, and I do a lot of connecting them to medical providers in the community so that they can get those, um, their condition at least stabilized. Um, I'm also a part-time clinical director for the Hartford Communities at Care, and it's I, Andrew Woods asked me to come on and head up the clinical division. Most of the clients that my staff and I work with are individuals, their families, who have been impacted by violence. When um, you read about or watch it on the news where individuals have been shot, we deal with the families, we deal with the families of the victims as well as the families of the perpetrators, and we try to provide some clinical support. So I have staff that go into the homes. We find out um, that it's not just one person, it's usually a family, and there's a lot of trauma. So my specialty area is really around the trauma and how do we educate. I have clients that are 15 that are actively using substances that could kill them in probably months or even years. And it's really hard, you know, when you're looking at a young child and saying you shouldn't do and trying to educate them on the risk because they can't see past tomorrow. Um, so the work is there and, you know, we've been able to partner with some of the agencies and, you know, provide that support like the case management and getting them connected <coughs> to outside resources so that we could support everyone in the home to decrease the behaviors and, and some of the conditions that we see. Thank you. Alrighty, thank you. Thank all of you for the introductions. And I, I apologize, you know, real quick, some housekeeping if you didn't know. There are restrooms outside the doors to your left, men and female. There's plenty of drink, liquid, to make sure you stay hydrated uh, in this heat. Uh, water, juice back there. There's also some other refreshments. Please feel free to partake as you will. Uh, when we were talking about this particular forum, we really wanted to focus more, you know, on the family dynamic and why I, I reached out to Andrew Barris, uh, Christie. We had, we had talked a few times about, you know, different things and just really begin to collaborate because as a harm reductionist, I've done frontline, you know, outreach to many of, of the parents, but, and, and I've heard this from other people also, you know, to talk more uh, about some of the youth also, and it's like not unfamiliar, you know, but still one of those things, it's, it's not my real comfort zone, you know, so it was like, okay, and I, you know, I understand we have to begin to, you know, address this. We do address the disease concept as a, as a family piece, but really beginning to, uh, apply some of the harm reduction concepts to a younger population also and to begin to work with agencies that we traditionally especially when we you know and, and Marsha knows a lot about this uh, with the mental health barris not you know with the the various age populations or the family dynamic we don't it's not our so this we don't dwell delve into it uh, and, and I don't want to start to stammer, as, as, and, and I'd really like to hear more, uh, if you would, Barris, uh, we've, we've talked at length, you know, about the different things that are going on presently. I'd like to hear some more from, you know, your, your take on it. And as well, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please feel free. Uh, we're not going to wait till the end. If you have a question, throw your hand up, and, and we'll use that to guide the conversation as well. Well, um, Favor being a, <clears throat> a family organization and a family-run organization, um, all those social determinants and factors that impact young people, impact children, our youth, um, are of my interest. And anything that our organization can do Anything that the dollars that we get from the federal government and from the state of Connecticut that can be directed to circumvent those social determinants can, you know, lead a child who may be having trouble um, in daycare. Um, uh, send them in a different direction, derail those things that um, 
uh, determines whether a child will end up uh, in juvenile in, uh, uh, justice involvement, will end up as an adult incarcerated. Anything that we can do from the onset, we, we try to do. Um, as far as information sharing, educating, and um, not only um, family members, but systems mm -hmm. on how to respond to those situations. We work in concert with Wheeler Clinic. We work in concert with um, Andrew Woods, with um, Health and Human Services on a state level, local level, and a federal level. Just came back from a, um, a conference in, in Washington, D.C that was um, sponsored by the University of Maryland. Every two years, um, there is a National um, uh, Trainers Institute around um, topics that um, impact families, such as opioid uh, use and what have you. And there's also a youth component. Um, one, of, one of the national youth organizations, Youth Move, is highly involved with um, the Department of Health and Human Services on the federal level, and along with um, SAMHSA. SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse Mental Health um, Service Association that sends a lot of dollars out um, to respond to, um, to these issues. Um, matter of fact, last week I was on, the phone, on a phone call uh, and had an opportunity to um, ask the um, Assistant uh, uh, Secretary of, uh, of uh, of SAMHSA uh, a question about how money comes into a state like Connecticut, how that how those contracts are executed, and if they can be, and what we can do um, to support them to be executed in a timely manner. So when, you know, we talk about what happens in, for, to a family, what happens on the street level, what happens on a systemic level, those two things um, connect. Um, the Under um, Secretary um, um, McCann Katz of SAMHSA, um, when she announced that SAMHSA as a, as a federal um, uh, uh, organization is providing $6 billion to address the opioid epidemic or crisis in our communities, and a lot of those communities are communities of color. Um, I. I, I am compelled to ask the question, um, how are we going to address this? Are we going to address this in the way we have historically addressed it, especially my exposure and my experience, um, families in my communities, and I come from this community right out here. Um, historically and routinely, um, people will find themselves in that situation where they are abusing drugs, whether, whether it's opioid, whether it's crack cocaine, or whatever, the response have been, has been punitive. Now they're talking about medical, a medical response or treatment to this crisis. Why are they talking about that now and how much does race and ethnicity in your zip code have to do with that? Those are the things that interest me as, a, as an approaching 60 year old African American male. I wonder these things because at five, at, at, in, in the fifth grade, Coming up Sigourney Street, everybody knows where that bridge is on Sigourney Street. Me and my friends found a, a, a pack of works, needles, and what have you, syringes. I was going to West Middle School at the time. I brought, and my friends, we brought those works to school. The eighth graders took it from us, and some of them are still on opioids, still shooting heroin now. The difference that I saw in that is opioid users and abusers in my community seem to do it or have a way to do it with less harm, whereas their counterparts in the, in the suburbs and rural areas are the ones that are coming in. And I don't know this as facts, but this is what I've seen. This is what I've experienced. Are coming into Hartford between 15 and 35 years old, and those are the ones that do it with more risk, overdosing and what have you. And I'm wondering, is this the, um, the antecedent to the response of our federal government to say, we're going to send $6, $6 billion in there, and we're going to have to, we have to have a different response because we can't treat these folks like we've been treating these folks in the city. I saw a, 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 a hand up, a question. Yes. 
six billion dollars. I don't know if it's all going to be for medical response. Some of it might be building um, confinement facilities, hardware lock facilities to keep some people in. But I think the important thing, and one message that I would want to send is, we can determine as constituents in this city, we can determine how that money comes into our city, how that money is spent. Although it may be a political decision that sends that money out, politics begins local, local, local. We elect our officials. Um, Hartford has 38 boards and commissions. We're about to have 39, hopefully. Um, uh, that 39th one will be uh, a commission or council on justice reform. All these things link into what we're talking about here. Uh, because I had a back problem years ago. They gave me opioids and I took it for 15 years and I gained my insides, got messed up, I gained so much weight and marijuana is what got me to where I am today. I was almost bedridden and I don't, it's hard for me to say because I don't know whether or not younger people would benefit from it because they don't have the mindset to know if it's hurting their future. But I'm here as a senior, you know, saying that I know that it will help seniors, but I'm, I don't know what to say about the, young, the younger generation. Marijuana was banned in America in, uh, I believe, 1936. Um, the reason why it was banned is questionable at best. Um, I remember seeing and researching and seeing commercials about um, reefer madness. Yeah, I remember. It, it, has, it has racial and ethnic overtones to it also. Um, I know through research that there are um, efforts in um, northern Massachusetts and New Hampshire to use marijuana um, as a uh, a, a weaning off of um, opioids. Um, I don't know how much that's embraced by our federal government, by our medical society, maybe someone else. Yeah, I would like to hear Robert. I was on the <laughs> yeah, one of his esteemed members of this panel can answer that better than I can. Um, what I'm seeing um, currently with uh, marijuana use, um, or even you could even say abuse, we have clients currently that have um, substituted taking their antipsychotics or even other medications to help treat their mental illness because they believe that the marijuana can help them. Um, Opiates in your system, um, yeah, you can become physically and psychologically addicted to opiates. Um, the problem is you still have to address what it is that you got to treat those immediate symptoms. And marijuana may help, but then it also has the adverse effects that it could impact a person's ability to, to function, to drive, to, to operate materials. I mean, there's you know, there's gonna be some setback, and, and that's what we have to look at. But treatment, you know, working in a methadone clinic, I've seen clients successfully come off of heroin and, and pain pills that have been on it for decades. And, you know, it's, it's medic, the, med, the medical providers will write the scripts, they're monitored, vitals are taken, blood work is done, and we get them to a therapeutic level where people can work. I've seen people who went from having nothing to owning their own homes, their businesses. Yeah, we're substituting one drug for another, but if it's monitored carefully, then there could be success. But then when you're looking at children, the substances affecting the brain development, yeah, we could have a backlash of that. And maybe Doc can give us more insight into that, but the treatment has to be monitored closely. All I have to say is all of these pills that are out here are killing us. Because I know I 
I was on so many medications, and now I'm take one, and my hair's better, my skin's better, my teeth are better, and it's because of the marijuana. And I hate to say that, I don't want to, you know. Yeah. In states that have legalized marijuana, oh, 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 thank you. In states that have legalized marijuana, opiate use is down 17%. Opiate organizations, uh, pharmaceutical companies, put a lot of money into anti legalization campaigns for marijuana. It's because they want to drop the, they don't want to lose the money from yeah. the pills. Yeah, I, it's ridiculous. I run a, uh, a treatment program for opiate addiction, and I have um, tremendous success in my program, and about a third to half of my clients smoke marijuana. We don't kick them out for it, and what I don't see happening is them having life problems associated with their marijuana use or returning to opiates because of their marijuana, yeah, yeah. and a certain percentage of them are using marijuana through the medical marijuana clinic to, because they come in with very severe PTSD and anxiety, and we, won't, we, we don't condone the use of benzodiazepines right. with, with um, yeah. Suboxone, it is no, because it's a contraindicated. Yeah. So we have to so we have to give them another out sometimes in terms of they, they need medication in addition to therapy. And sometimes that, that out is marijuana for them. Yeah. And the farmers and the, the clinics, the uh, the dis dis marijuana dispensaries, they are like they're like TAC pharmacists. They work with them very specifically on how to yeah, address I go their dispensary, go to farm yeah. wellness. Robert, would you like to weigh in? Weigh in on it? I see you reached a couple times. We'll come back to it. I'm sorry. Um, just deviating a little bit, but not too much. Um, I was a pharmacy technician for about almost 10 years across three different states, including this one. And um, I just wanted any of you experts to speak upon the interaction between having the medical piece being a part of all of this. Because as a tech, what I saw a lot was people picking up oxy prescriptions like they were M&Ms, mm -hmm. or picking up hydro uh, hydromorphone prescriptions like they were M&Ms. So I'm just curious as to how the state is dealing with that. I, I know that there has been a new DEA system, and that has worked somewhat. But um, what kind of improvements would you like? Would you guys recommend or like to see in regards to that? Yeah, I think this is this is something I can weigh in on a bit. Um, the current opioid epidemic, which is actually the third in American history, um, is is this is, is almost a consequence of um, you know good intentions gone bad. The 80s and 90s people began to recognize that pain in this in this country was prevalent and undertreated. And unfortunately, the tool we had in the toolbox was opiates. So we started prescribing opiates for all kinds of pain. Now, opiates are fabulous drugs for acute trauma or post-surgery. You know, post but it's, they're terrible medications for chronic pain, chronic neuromuscular pain, chronic, uh, in, in, you know, it, it, you know, uh, neuro, neuro, uh, the pain from autoimmune disease, um, all of those things for which it was prescribed, as you say, you know, just giving out pills like they were water, um, you know, and that it just didn't work. And um, so we had a, a large increase in the number of people who were became dependent upon and, in fact, uh, addicted to uh, pharmaceutical opiates. Uh, we've tried to rein that in. Um, the consequences of which have been increased opioid overdoses, and how are we going to deal properly with, with chronic pain? And I think we have never done enough research to answer that. Your, your anecdote about um, you know, using, using marijuana for your own, your own individual treatment of chronic pain is a story I've heard lots of. Um, but we've never been able to do research with marijuana because the federal government scheduled it as Schedule One, which means it has no medical use. So we can't do medical research with it. It's a, it's one of these catch 22s where you can't, you can't do the work you need to prove that something works. So you say you can't use it, you can't prescribe it, 
So we're in this, this horrible cycle. Um, maybe that will change uh, in the next few years as, as more and more research on marijuana and chronic pain uh, begin to be done finally uh, as states are, when more and more states are permitting uh, medical marijuana to be used for exactly that purpose. I, I, I heard today that the state of Connecticut has just yesterday increased the number of conditions for which medical marijuana can be prescribed. Um, that's a good step. I don't know. I, I didn't read enough detail to find out whether or not they're now going to allow its prescribing for chronic pain. But it's certainly something we can advocate for to the, to the Department of Public Health and, and try to figure out how to uh, um, you know, get that kind of trial done. Because we need better treatment for chronic pain. It's, it's, it, it is so debilitating for so many people. If I can say something else also about the response to chronic pain, um, I think um, we have to be honest when we talk about um, uh, the medical society, um, racial implications, um, uh, the, the impact of um, discrimination and, uh, and bias when it comes to the treatment of, of pain in our history in this country. Um, the fact that um, there are some, in some areas there, are, there is a discriminatory practice not to give um, uh, people of color um, those strong opioids. Um, there's uh, data, there's documentation that um, uh, qualifies that these practices did exist. Um, I look at that as the peripheral impact of, of racism, that um, those who may be initiation, initiating that discrimination um, had this backfire on them, the fact that um, kids or, uh, or individuals of affluent um, um, communities were getting these um, um, Oxycontins, um, hydra or morphine um, prescriptions um, were more apt to find themselves abusing heroin when that prescription ran out and less folks in um, urban areas or impoverished areas were getting these scripts um, but the um, uh, the opioid uh, use or abuse still rate uh, uh, still uh, remained in those areas um, I think when we talk about those social determinants and other things that why we have this epidemic and um, we have to consider all those things and we have to address those problems on a social um, level also. Um, just coming out and providing um, a medical response to opioid use um, or abuse, um, I don't think is enough. I think addressing um, social justice and, and racial justice is something that we have to consider across the board also. And I want to, <coughs> real quick, you want to say something, Christy? Yeah, I was hoping go to on. go back to your original question in terms of how the family work comes together, and mm -hmm. that's kind of where my expertise comes in. Um, I oversee multiple evidence-based programs at Wheeler Clinic that provide in-home services to both adolescents and adults. And in terms of the family work, I agree that family work is key in yes. order to have success. That we can have people go outpatient and receive all kinds of services, but ultimately the family and their supports are gonna be in their lives forever. And they're really the experts in their family. They know them inside and out. They know what, how to best support them. And part of our role as our therapists and um, peer recovery support workers is to best support them and looking at this issue from a systemic point of view like you had identified so we don't say you know someone uses because they have a problem there's often many reasons why we do everything that we do there's many reasons for why you came here today that there probably just isn't one in particular so we look at this from a systemic way of looking at individually what's going on with uh, the client from a family perspective what's going on in their community their schools and the people that they associate with so it's really kind of all these different factors that are driving them to have and act the way they are 
and part of our role is to kind of intercept in that and figure out, well, what are the triggers? What's going on? Is, is it that certain bridge that they go to that they know that, you know, if I'm having a rough day, if I go to that bridge, I know I can find something to use. So how can we use those supports to say, hey, I can see you're having a rough day. Why don't we go for a walk in this direction or let's go do something differently to kind of stop that sequence. And part of our role too is with some of that, you said the six billion, I don't know the exact number, but we did get some of that funding to see how we can best support them and to use the medical component to help support them. So we can give them medicated assistant treatment, but we're gonna have them see a primary care physician and we're gonna go with them. They're gonna come and they can come to Wheeler or they can go to another facility and we are gonna be speaking to the doctor. We're gonna be speaking to the person prescribing. We're gonna make sure that they're using it appropriately, that we're testing them to make sure that they're taking it appropriately, not selling it, not skipping doses and I think it's all of those things much like this says it takes a village yes. in order to best support them talking to the school how can we get them involved in activities um, how can we get them in community service giving them things to do getting them employed so that they have things to fill their time I'm hearing yesterday in the news that approximately 25 percent of adolescents that are uh, attending school in Hartford. You know, that is a large percentage and that's a large chunk of their day that's unmonitored out in the community that they're able to get into um, mischief, just like any other town. If we, you know, it just happened to see that in the bottom of the ticker yesterday. So it's how can we collaborate together and just like this to put our brains together and figure out if we had the ideal world and we can have all these services, what would it look like? And who's to say that we can't do that? We have this money coming in, we need to advocate for this stuff. Absolutely. And so I think it's how can we work together like this continuously to provide those services? I think looking at um, what the federal government has done around smoking cessation, mm -hmm. um, about a billion dollars came to Connecticut. How much of that billion dollars was used to uh, you know, um, boost um, uh, anti-smoking campaigns or what have you. I, I'm, I'm, I'll go out on a limb and take a risk and say not much of that billion dollars was used for that. Zero. Um, and <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> but um, I think Christy um, brings up an excellent point when we talk about um, systemic um, um, uh, response. Um, and she talks about family. I think that is very important. Um, she talked about employment. Um, I. I I'm coining a phrase that's saying families or benefactors, and I, I, I call, rather than saying client, rather than saying patient, I like to use the word benefactor even more than consumer. Because if we have this initiative, and it is to address opioid use, who's the, who's the primary benefactor? Is it not the people that are um, abusing um, uh, uh, opioids? If we have a justice system, uh, 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 Department of Corrections, who is that to benefit? Is it just to benefit the people on the outside or is it to benefit the people that we incarcerate? If we have a juvenile justice system, who should be the, who should be the benefactors? If we have insurance, you all have insurance, one way or the other. I actually sit on the um, oversight committee for um, children's behavioral health insurance in, in, um, in Connecticut. Not only do I sit on that committee or that council, I am one of the tri-chairs of that council. So when dollars come into Connecticut to respond to opioid use and addiction, a lot of those individuals are on Husky insurance. Their kids receive those insurance um, benefits that the council I sit on oversees. So when we have a discussion around opioids, I have to consider the impact that it has on children. Who better to speak for those children but themselves? And when they can't speak for themselves, their parents and members from their community or people that have skin in the game have that experience. When it comes to opioid use, who can better speak to that but the benefactors of these types of uh, initiatives? And those benefactors should be fully employed in the process of making those changes, not 
the mayor, not the governor, not even the commissioner of, of, of demons. They should be taking guidance from individuals that are impacted and affected by those, those situations. 38 boards and commissioners in Hartford, guarantee you one of them addresses this issue. And people in this room should be on that, that council and on that committee. Does that make sense? Phil, you got something to say, Phil? Yeah. You know, Mark has uh, indoctrinated me, I guess, into the whole concept of harm reduction. You know, all, most of you up here are involved in treatment. And the data that I see is only about 20% of people who need treatment are in treatment at any given time. So what are we doing for the 80% of the people who are not in treatment? I mean, are we reaching out to them? Are we providing services to them? You know, I don't see, you know, I've worked in the <coughs> dependency field for 40 years. And uh, yeah, once upon a time, we used to have, back in, as, as Bob was saying, you know, in the early 90s, Connecticut was really in the forefront with the HIV epidemic. Uh, and some of the legislation that was passed was, uh, uh, was groundbreaking at the time. And one of the things we had at that time, I think that was very effective, that we don't have, we had outreach workers. Yes. We had people in the communities, on the streets, talking to people. You know, as far as I know, most of that, most of those services have disappeared uh, over the year. And here we are again in the midst of another epidemic. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure what we're doing to try to reach out to these people. Uh, to get them into the services that you guys provide. And I don't know if there's a plan to do that in the future. I could say for our programming, we're trying to, we're always looking for opportunities to do outreach and to let everyone know about the services that we provide. We're going to um, police departments, EMTs, firefighters, thinking they're kind of first responders out in the community. Someone calls 911, detox centers, um, pediatricians, veterinarians, sometimes we're, you know, using their um, animals prescribed meds, really trying to figure out outside of the box in terms of where we can locate these people. Um, we're very much trying to do that. I, there's information up there, gotta put in a plug, that we have a resource fair coming up on September 19th at Wheeler for the community just to let them know about some of the services that we do provide so if someone is struggling or if they know someone their family member that is that they can give them that information um, if anyone were to call we would certainly go out and talk about the program um, anything that we can do so we it, it's often a struggle because I think there's also a negative connotation with it and people are afraid to look for services or they feel like they can manage it on their own and it's not until they're put in a really dangerous situation until they do make that choice. Um, but it's definitely um, a work in progress. And I look to any ideas that any of you have out here in terms of any alternative um, outreach efforts that you think would be successful. You know, and, and real quick, and I'm, I'll get right back to you, George. Uh, I would personally really like to see more of our community we that we are doing or having other venues that really draws in the actual community versus and i hate to say the usual suspects because believe me you know it's great to see us here and gathered but it's like <coughs> you know i'd much rather be talking to some other people than you are all right. I mean, the people who are really going to use and see the services and benefit from the services. So what do we do? What, what can we do to get outside of ourselves and, draw, you know, draw in some other people to the conversation? Because there is some, some really good conversation to be had, you know. Um, but when I, you know, when I look out right now, uh, I... I well, it's the same folk that come, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I'd like to, I want to divert, if, if I can, for a moment. 
uh, is a gentleman here with us, Peter Peter Canning, and and this gentleman right here, he works with EMS, and he does a blog, and, and just just a very informative uh, individual, but he's also been part of uh, a, pro a program, if you will, to collect data on the amount of overdose that's taking place in the area. And I'd like for Peter to talk briefly, if he would, about it. Sure. Um, so my name's Peter Canning. Um, I've been a paramedic, full-time paramedic in Hartford since 1995. And I would agree with a lot of things that you were saying is back then, you know, as a paramedic, uh, you know, there was a drug, the drug war was all about the, the shooting that was going on. And in the meantime, I was seeing all these dead people in abandoned buildings and stuff, and nobody was paying any attention to them. I used to think that, you know, uh, that addicts were, it was character flaw, that these people were riffraffed. Um, but over time, I started asking them, you know, right, I used to say to them, you know, just say no, you're going to kill yourself. I started asking them, not why you use, but how did you first start using? And I started hearing these stories, and it was incredible, the stories that people told me. Um, I had no idea until a couple years ago what harm reduction was. Um, and through, through Mark and some, some other people, I started to learn this stuff. Um, so now I've become, become very involved in uh, trying to educate EMS, and I've learned a lot that this is, you know, truly is a, a disease, um, and that people, you know, are, are doing the best that they can to, to survive, and it's our job to help them and, and be compassionate toward them. Um, I'm also the uh, EMS coordinator at John Dempsey Hospital, and we started a new program using poison control. So right now it's in the prime, uh, the pilot project is, I, so I work for American Medical Response, so we cover everything from Park Street North, um, Aetna does Park Street South. So right now, whenever somebody responds to an opioid overdose call, immediately after the call, we call poison control, and we answer a series of questions. You know, how old was the person? Um, what did they overdose on? Did they require naloxone? Um, are they a chronic user? Or had, is this the, did they just recently get out of rehab or something, or is it they using the same amount? Was there a bag associated with it? Um, their ages and stuff. And starting in October, we're gonna be collecting ethnicity. Um, in addition, in October, Aetna Ambulance is going to contribute, so we'll have a whole picture of Hartford. Um, and the, the Department of Health is excited about our project, and uh, it may become, expand beyond that. But So I've been sending Mark some of the data. It's very interesting. Hartford's quite unique from the rest of the state. A lot of our overdoses are in public places rather than in homes. Um, the ages is very interesting. It's uh, there's not a lot of really young people overdosing. A lot of it, it's like men 35 to 50, yeah. and it's predominantly men over females. Yeah. Um, but so it's interesting that we're changing the questions as we go. Um, but it, it's the idea is to see how well poison control can surveil it, um, to collect data, and to establish an early warning system. So if suddenly there's a big spike one day, if you know on. Uh, you know, a uh, park in, uh, in, in Broad, somebody overdoses on a, a bag that says killing time, and then, you know, two hours later, three people overdose on the same bag, you know, uh, over at, uh, you know, Albany and Center or something like that, we can get people out on the street and get the word out there. Mm -hmm. So, but anyways, it's interesting, and I salute Mark and all of you, and uh, I'm trying to get everybody in EMS to be deputized into the harm reduction army. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Peter, I, I, I would like to um, talk to you after uh, about the data you're collecting. I, I sit on the board of Inform Connecticut. That's the board for um, the um, Connecticut Data Collaborative. I think some of your data will be valuable sharing with the right with, with Connecticut uh, residents. We send the data out to our partners. We send it to Mark, um, the Department of Public Health, and we will get a bunch of people on the list, and we'll send it out to them. This is draft data every month. We're going to have an official um, data after our first five months. But we're, we're working on, we got to get a better computer. Com right now, some of it I'm doing by hand. So we're going to try to get a computerized system so, so it can be out there quicker. But the goal is not like, you know, the medical examiner's office, you get it six months, a year later. This, we want to get it in a more timely way. We're also open to particular questions. 
that people want to have. Uh, <coughs> so the Hartford um, Public Health asked us to add ethnicity. Um, well, one of the I other, just one, one, one. Um, it's for targeting your education. So if uh, you're finding out that most of the people who are overdosing in your city are Hispanic uh, men between the ages of you know 50 and 60 or whatever, you may be able to target some education toward them. Uh, the goal for us right now is to get the, edu the data out there and then let the experts decide how they're going to use it. The one thing I did want to mention is we also write who gave, when the lock zone is given, who's given it. And the key thing for me, when I started, the only people who could give the lock zone were paramedics. And now, half the time, the person is revived before the ambulance even arrives. Yes. Combination of community in the lock zone and police and fire carrying the lock zone now, which they didn't used to do. So that's been very interesting. And I'll tell you, the information already that Peter and them have gathered, like I was at a meeting at the Litchfield County Opioid Task Force and one of the other members brought it up to say, hey, they're doing this over there and how could it benefit us and how can we do it out here? Uh, and, you know, also a conversation with uh, the police chief in Bristol who said, can we turn around and possibly go back after someone has overdosed and maybe go as a collaborative, and they do this in Gloucester, uh, Gloucester, uh, is go back firefighters and harm reduction. It's a good friend of mine, Gary, and they visit families. They go back out to wherever the overdose took place, and they revisit to make sure that naloxone is in that household and any other services that the family may need can at that point be offered, you know, by someone who is, uh, I, I don't want to say offensive, you know, but a lot of the reason people fear services, maybe police, especially when calling 911, is a fear of police. So to have other people engage, we have a young lady, we have a, a, a bridge to life, uh, Jackie, uh, is with a church, and their organization, although faith-based, they really do some work in the community, you know, and there sometimes there's other avenues or, or ven, you know, people we can use to really engage that family unit. Uh, this guy should be before me because you get the knowledge that when I have something to, to, to say about um, Don't worry about it. I, <laughs> 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 I don't even know whether I need the mic or not, but my name is uh, Father Micah Paro, and I'm the president of the Newington Clergy Interfaith uh, Association. And we had invited Mark to come and speak to our meeting, what was it, in uh, uh, July, I think. And he had an emergency, and so he couldn't make it. And there I am waiting with a Subway sandwich in my hand that I had bought for him, okay, because it was a brown bag uh, noontime meeting. Anyway, we've been talking about this problem for some time. And by the way, I have the naloxone in, my, in the trunk of my car, so wherever I am, that is, okay. As a direct result of a forum that we did in Wethersfield in April, I believe, that uh, you were there. And by the way, Mark and I have known each other since, I don't know which one of us was knee-high to a uh, <laughs> grasshopper or what, but in any case, for a long, long time, and I really respect and admire him. Um, anyway. So we've been talking about this and we're planning, if you can come back, <laughs> we're planning um, or send some people to speak to us, a forum, I think in October. And I, by the way, I posted the ad for this on our Facebook page. We got a new Facebook page. It's called the Newington Interfaith Clergy Association, if anybody wants to look it up. And all of this conversation started because several months ago, one of our retired ministers from the United Church of Christ, that's right on the corner of Cedar and Main Street, and she lives up the street, and she's been noticing that Newington, believe it or not, is a transition place between New Britain and Hartford, and there's a lot of mules going back and forth, okay, and, and uh, gang colors are visible and uh, all kinds, and kids as young as nine years old are being recruited to be carriers, okay. So we met with our uh, uh, police chief, I think, last March, okay, in my house, as a matter of fact. And uh, I tell you, the, the, the response at that time was not very positive, okay, but we're working on him. 
but we have all of these faith communities. This is the answer to the question that you were raising and that you know, you're involved in. And uh, we are ready to do our part. So help us out you know, with consultation, with information, and, and stuff like that, OK? I'd certainly like to collaborate as well, and I literally just friend requested you. Well, so. well, by the way, I want to say something else. I, I, I'm a former LCSW, OK? I oh, let my license. Nice. I let my license uh, lapse because now... You know I'm, how expensive it is now? You better... Uh, yeah, well, also, okay. I'm, I'm 80 years old and I have nothing to do with private practice, but I was a psychiatric social worker at Cedar Crest Hospital wow. uh, and then a volunteer after that until it closed, mm. okay? So I have... And I've been to Wheeler Clinic and mm -hmm. gotten some, you know, all kinds of wonderful education uh, there and so forth. So just to let you know that. I, I, I don't, I'm just real quick also, and he didn't say anything, and I, I got like choked up because uh, I, I guess as a young, as, as a young person, my mom brought me to see Mike when I was young. I don't know if Kenny, if you remember Mike, but my mom knew the issues that, you know, we were facing in the inner city and thought we should have you know, outside counseling, and I, which I think for her as a mom back then, but Mike has known me, you know, he, he from, when I say knee, when he says knee high, yes, he, he does, and it's like I get kind of choked up. <laughs> I really don't need a mic either. Uh, I was listening to uh, what Phil said, and one of the things, I've been doing treatment for the last 17 years, and one thing I don't see anymore is the conventional outreach workers that go to the outreach. Right. You can't do outreach from your office and hope somebody's going to show up. Uh, you know, if you can't go out to the crack houses and, and make a relationship there and them knowing why you're there, no one's going to stop smoking crack and says, I think I want treatment now. Because by the time they get to your office, somebody gave them another hit, and we don't start a vicious cycle all over again. Um, another thing I, I see a lot of, I see organizations have policies and procedures, and they don't work for people. They work for agencies only. That's right. That's what they do. You talk about uh, family, doing family work, getting somebody reemployed. But if you don't have employers on board to hire these people, you just got them on a hamster wheel like they're a little hamster running. You see, you know, I, I've been doing this. I, I've worked with the judicial system as well. Um, I'm about to do a... a workshop on diversity because if you don't know how to talk to people or what's going on in that home you have broken that's 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 a broken fix already um you know i, I brought a point up um language if you don't know the language of the street you can't you're not going to get into nobody okay um we'll, we'll call a street worker a prostitute but if you say that to somebody on the street and they look at you like you're crazy no i don't do any prostitution but if you ask me, is he tricking? No, oh, I do a little bit of that. Okay, knowing what you're talking about and how you're going to deliver the service is how you get them engaged in what you're doing. They got to um, trust you. They, they got to trust you. You have to develop a rapport. And, and I've seen clinicians that I've worked with from various diverse backgrounds. The key is to just be yourself. And if you don't know the language, ask somebody. That that's how you get well, you get you get that engagement going. Well, They're the experts. We, I think a couple of you said that. Our people that we serve are the experts, so we just need to have them teach us some well, stuff. Well, ask them one question. You help me help you instead <laughs> yeah. of me telling you how I'm going right. to help you. Absolutely. Because when I sure. start to tell you how I'm going to help you, right it's there, done. I don't want to hear nothing else you got to say. Right. But if I, if I get engaged into doing this, yeah. you know, um, I, got a, I got a strategy. I tell them all. I'm old. I'm gray. I cannot carry nobody. But I will walk this journey with you. Yeah. I'm a little slow. You gotta wait for me, but we're gonna walk this together. And they hear that. Yeah. What they don't hear is me saying, Well, um, you were five minutes late. Um, you, you didn't do this. Um, another thing, um, how are we doing medicated assisted treatment? Are we just making pharmacies rich? You know, um uh, I, I work with a suboxone program and it was always a taper down. And if you didn't work, we bring you back up. But we don't keep you there until you say we we try to encourage you to at some point maybe one day you won't need to show up here and empower you like you said it, it's a family so you, you you bring up a lot of points and i talked about the systemic response and we can't only look at uh the user and say there's something wrong with him 
we have to look back at the system and say, there's something wrong with the system. Because over the years, if our response hasn't been level as a system, and we know it hasn't, in, in the 60s, you talked about capitalism, they put you on McCarthy list. That was akin to communism. Some of you in here are old enough to, to remember that, like myself. Um, now, we taunt our capitalistic characteristics in our ways as if the playing field was ever level. So when we overlay that on top of a medical response to opioid use, you know that we're found wanting as a system. That's why I talk about fully employ the benefactor in the treatment, in structuring the system, in saying what it is that we need. And what we need is a level playing field. What we need is full employment in the process. That goes from everything, politics to in your home, how we respond to our, our children when they ask us questions. And I could have brought that, I could have brought those needles home to my mother, who worked 26 years on the psych ward at, at St. Francis Hospital. What would her response have been if she wasn't educated in that process? So it takes participation, education, and then action to, 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 to make the change. But understand with change, the process of change, change is always accompanied by inconvenience and harm. We have an, uh, an obligation to minimize the harm, not marginalize it. A lot of uh, uh, our response gets marginalized because of the way we perceive those folks that are involved in drug use and drug abuse. You talk about out, outreach workers. Some people call them peers, right? Former users. If they're looking down at the users, they're looking down at the out, the system is looking down at the out, outreach workers too. You didn't get paid that much, did you? They put you in the same category. They look down their nose, the system. It was a top-down response. If you balance a pyramid on its head, all right, it's not gonna work. You have to turn it around, bounce it on its base, all right, which are those primary benefactors, fully employ them in the process, bottom up and top down. We meet in the middle and uh, create something comprehensive that works. Pyramid, also representing a delta, denotes change. Like I said, change is usually accompanied by harm. That's what we feel, that's what we perceive, because we're not understanding why it has to change. Those people, and, and opioid use is not a, a, a black thing. It's not. it's not a Hispanic or brown thing. As many hundred or six figure folks out there that are doctors, lawyers, or what have you, have opioid issues. Mm -hmm. And they can afford treatments different than we can. What, pe what some people are afraid of is the punitive response. Well, you, and you, that's what some of us has been get, have been getting all our lifetimes, and that's what we have seen. I'd, I'd be afraid to send my, my child for treatment if, if they come back in. Full disclosure, um, I'm not gonna sit up here and act like I, I've never sniffed heroin. I was in Germany, 1982, 1981. Sniffed heroin five times. Before I was in the service and went to Germany, smoked a couple of lace joints with heroin. I didn't know you could smoke heroin. Um, had friends that were um, mixing uh, heroin with uh, speed, speedballing. Yeah, I think that's what they call it. Yeah. So the person that is lacing marijuana with heroin is abusing opioids. Yeah. Person that is sniffing heroin is abusing opioids. It's not just an IV drug use. It's, it's not just sticking that needle in your skin, but I can tell you, when I was sniffing it and judging the man next to me that was banging it, I felt better. But that's the ignorance of it. Well, not, not just the ignorance, but the hierarchy.
Absolutely. You know, uh, of the person who just smokes weed versus the person who just sniffs coke versus the person, you know, intravenous drug users are generally somewhere in the lower echelon yeah. of that hierarchy. Yeah. No you know? right. But this, we have to understand that this epidemic and, and some of the reasons why things continue to go on, again, come back to licit or pharmaceutical Opioids, you know, and the fact that we're such a, a, I, I want to have gratuitous, I don't know if it's the right word, but, you know, in any triage still, when you're seen by a medical practitioner, one of the first things they're going to ask you is on a scale from 1 to 10, uh, where is your pain level, you know? And it could be a 2, but I guarantee you nobody says 2. They, they jump right to the other end of the scale, and it's not because you're going to get a lollipop. You know, you're, you're going to get a script, and, and whether or not you're going to use that script, it's going to go into your cabinet just in case or for when. It's there, and it's that reason that right now we see that four out of five people who presently experience opioid use disorder found it somewhere in somebody else's medicine cabinet or got it or started there, you know, and it just progressed. Uh, and the other societal things now that we have market and demand, that the fact that the United States makes up about 5% of the world's population, but we consume upwards of 80% of the world's prescription drugs, there's a huge market is a huge market. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of different things, especially, you know, I'm the harm reductionist. I'm one that likes to shout things out about that. Uh, you know, we, we, we've, we've walked a great deal into the woods, if you will, with this, in this epidemic. And I don't think there's any easy answers to get out. I don't think it's anything, and Robert, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that's going to happen overnight. It's going to take some time. You know, when we talk about, you see the different types of drugs and fentanyl and how fentanyl has permeated the heroin, not just the heroin supply, but also counterfeit pills. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and the danger in that, because with the counterfeit pills, and I don't want to switch over to, to make this one of you know, our trainings, but if, if you have five pills, five counterfeit pills, the strength of each one may be different. And, and one of those could, you know, be potentially fatal. You know, because fentanyl chocolate chips when it's pressed into a pill. But when you talk about the profit margin and the return on investment for someone pressing those counterfeit pills is huge. It is, you know, too much almost to pass up. So we've, we've got a long way to go. Uh, and like, I, I'd really like to believe that some of the work that we're doing in, as a matter of fact, Greater Hartford is in the process of opening uh, an outreach drop-in center, a harm reduction drop-in center. Uh, this Friday is International Overdose Awareness Day, and we are having the grand opening of that center at 557 Albany Avenue this Friday. Uh, it's going to be one of those low-threshold drop-in centers. Bears? Mark, um, before we end, and I don't know what time we're going to end, but um, I would be remiss um, if I didn't say, and this is my opinion, and I speak about my opinion, and I speak ex experientially, um, let's not just talk about um, opioid um, use or misuse or addiction without talking about addiction, be addictive behavior in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, if we're going to talk about the social determinants, we have to talk about addictive behavior. We said, and a couple of you all said that marijuana use um, as a wean down from opioid abuse, um, uh, for some folks, marijuana use 
because of their addictive behavior, is a gateway to opioid use. I'm not going to sit up here and say, no, it isn't. I'm not going to sit up here and defend marijuana, marijuana use. But um, if I had a choice, I'd, I'd smoke marijuana rather than smoking or shooting up heroin. I, I know enough about that. But um, addictive behavior um, is something, and because um, favor works um, in supporting uh, folks with mental health disorders, um, I, I, I have to say that. So um, we need to pay as much attention to addictive behaviors as a, a, a mental health situation, as much as we have, as much as we do um, um, opioid um, use and uh, abuse, because one feeds the other. You know, I want to say, and, and not to, to disagree, but again, it's just my nature, because you made a statement uh, uh, that, you know, marijuana being safer, and we can't, we can't assume drug-related harm is more for one individual for an, as it is for another. Right, right, right. Um, and I'm not saying that. All right. But I've seen what, folk, what, I've seen what, folk what folk I notice well, and what I too. see is that many times we treat people at one end of the continuum. And a lot of times, uh, most often, we don't get to address. I mean, our best efforts on the, in the abstinence model abstinence model, we reach about 12% of that population. So we have a whole nother group of individuals that we don't get to engage because they maintain jobs. Their use has not reached a chaotic state. Or they don't have a chance to reach those resources that we offer. So again, why I put it out there, you know, we're in the midst of one of the worst epidemics we faced as a generation, but still many of our practices haven't changed. The business models, the hours of operation haven't changed. So how can we be in the midst of this huge epidemic and, and not again really begin to change some of our, you know, what, modus operandi? Sir. Mine is a multi-dimensional sort of question. Um, I, I've worked with the hospitals, I've worked um, with the kids who had HIV. Like you, I worked for the dispensary, and now I also work with penis. Um, and what I've noticed is, across the board, there's a disconnect between who I'm working with, a, a lack of education on either treatment or co-occurring disorders, and how do you get all of that to connect at once. I mean, you're talking about education, you're talking about engaging like natural supports, you're talking about educating partially on, you know, hepatitis and how that connects and again, the clinical piece of it. That's a lot to try to change and try to get on top of this epidemic. That's, I mean, for all intents and purposes, this isn't new. You it's know what not, I mean? <laughs> this isn't not, new. And so, and you're right. And there's such a multi, uh, like a, a, you know, layer to this. I mean, there is a huge racial piece to this. When you, I mean, I know that you were saying this just as you had saw it, but when you look on that little, you know, the bottom of your screen, a lot of people use that as fact, mm -hmm. you know, and they say, oh, the North End again, yes. you know? So how do you, how do you connect all these dots? You know, how do you educate the, the provider? I mean, I've gone to, I mean, I, I am that person mm -hmm. for Demas doing the community outreach. I'm going with my clients to their doctor's appointments. I'm educating medical professionals on what methadone maintenance is and yes. what, you know, now socks on, like all these things. And it's like, but you're still prescribing them Percocet. Can you please stop? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, they're not asking these questions. They're not saying before I, they, they're asking you, yeah, where's your pain level on a, scale one to 10, but they're not saying, hey, do you have a history of substance use? So how do you connect all those? That's a lot. So if I can respond, I think what George said um, is very important. Language, language, language matters. Um, it matters to the extent that we speak a, lang a language that is defined by an elite ma white male power structure. We don't even define our own words. Um, but I'm fluent in DCF. I'm fluent in demons. 
I'm fluent in the Department of Education. I'm also fluent in the language we speak in our culture out here in the North End of Hartford. Um, my formal education, I'm, I'm a college dropout two times, but I hold a PhD position. And if I wasn't fluent in those languages, I wouldn't be able to, you know, be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in a position where I could add to the solution. You have to understand your audience. You have to understand who you're speaking to. And when I say, and I, I delineated between DCF, DEMIS, DSS, routinely and historically in Connecticut, those entities and those agencies have not conversed with each other. True. Juvenile justice wouldn't talk with DCF, but they'd be involved in the same kid's life. When a punitive response to opioid abuse puts an individual in jail, does the Department of Correction talk to the medical system, the society saying, is there a service for that person? And there may be a service at a certain level, but is it, a, is it a complete service? Is it a service when we incarcerate somebody for opioid abuse? Is there a, a counselor that goes out and talks to the family to see how it impacts the family? So when that individual comes out, they, they're embraced by that family and there's support there. That seldom happens in my experience. Maybe it happens somewhere else and someone else can talk about it. But from what I've seen and what I've experienced, that wasn't there. All those pieces weren't there. So I am concerned when um, Undersecretary McCann's cats says there's six billion dollars coming down. Are we there to receive it? Are we there to guide it and direct it for its best outcomes for our families and our constituents? That's what I want to know. So you don't see me a lot on these panels talking about that because I try to be at the policy level tables where the, those decisions are being made on how that money would be, is, is going to be spent, how it's going to come in this community and what we're going to do. Because so many times in the past, that money has been uh, in, uh, in, uh, um, intercepted before it got here. And I can tell you out of the $6 billion, probably 60% of it is going to go to um, salary and, and fringe benefits. So out what of $6 billion. I, what I'd like to do, and, and we're going to start to wind down. Um, <coughs> Kenny, you want to say something? All right. It's starting with you, Roxanne, you know, in, in a final word, if you will. Uh, where, where do we go from here? Um, we've all mentioned it in some piece of the, um, this discussion, but the biggest thing that I see that I believe can work because we are representatives of some agency is the collaboration. We have to, have to, have to collaborate. Strength in numbers. When, you know, if we're all connected to an agency or if there's a, a, um, an agency that has a level of trust within the community, we need to partner with those, the, with those community either leaders or agencies or churches or church groups so that we can provide that level of support. Educating. I've noticed, because um, I also volunteer for the National Association of Black Social Workers, and we've been invited to several events through the churches. I've noticed that when we bring information, especially around like substance abuse and um, childhood behaviors or symptoms, those are gone. I'm not even joking. I could have stacks of everything else, other disorders. They take those two things. So that tells me people are concerned, but they don't know where to go. We may have to just be strategic. You don't, you know, like you said, you don't want to tell somebody what to do. But if you offer them information and, and put it in, a, in their language and make sure that you're present at different events. If you go to a church or you have friends that go to church on the north end of Hartford or, or out in Bloomfield, um, um, out there in Bloomfield or wherever, you know what? Let me know when you're having a church event. The, the fears that they have, the health fears, that's a good place for us to have information because the families need that. They may not bring it up, but if they have the resources, they can read about it, they can pass it on. When your children have school events, like my son's a senior now, he's gonna be doing college night. You think I'm not gonna throw some pamphlets on the table? 
you know, these are things that we can do and we're still trying to connect our families for services or resources. First, let me say um, I appreciate all of you being here and having an opportunity to share my opinion and some of my experience with you all. Um, I'm proud to be um, part of such an esteemed panel. And Mark, thank you for um, putting on this forum. Um, Politics, and politics begins locally. If we want to change um, the outcomes for people that we love, people that impact us, um, people that we pass by and see on the street, um, we need to get involved in our local politics. Um, that's, that's the most I can say. I think I've said a, a lot um, uh, this evening, but um, if I can impart anything on you all, um, Please consider that. Uh, that's the best thing uh, that we can do. I have an obligation, um, self-appointed obligation, to change the world. I'm a, a member of the human species of this society, and I'm not supposed to like everything I see, but I dislike too much that I see. We must and we can do better. Christy. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming out. Oh, thank you, um, <laughs> Mike and Mia. Um, and I agree with both of you that collaboration is key, that I think we often at times are divided between agencies and who's getting contracts, who has certain services, and we kind of stay in our own bubbles. And that doesn't necessarily help everyone, that it's really this is what I can offer, what can you offer, how can we best help our constituents, our um, consumers that you know are really gonna be able to benefit because you might have something that I don't have and that could be a great thing. So I think getting, collaborating, sharing information is key. Having events like this where we're able to get together like I said, I already Facebook friend requested you while I was up here because I think, you know, I was like, don't forget that. You'll forget that. So um, I think it's those types of things that are really helpful. And I'm really hoping that I've gotten out some of the word and some of the programs that I have too. And that I will be honest, there's some programs that we have that are underutilized. I have programs that I have staff ready and waiting to service people. and. It's a matter of getting the word out, like you said, to let people know the services that we have, that um, it doesn't matter about finances, it doesn't matter about insurance, and you know, how can we best support those in the community that need the help? Well, to end on a slightly different note, um, <laughs> we have spent the better part of an hour talking about problem with drugs and drug abuse and drug addiction. Um, but not all drug use is necessarily harmful. And in fact, some drug use benefits the people who use those drugs, as we heard one anecdote of tonight. And one of the problems is that we have criminalized drug use to the point and, and unequally enforce those laws against black and brown communities to the point where um, we almost have to st stop thinking about uh, focusing on the, the, the criminalizing and the problems of drug abuse and think about ways that we can get people to use, and this goes right back to the harm reduction mantra, to use drugs more safely. Because people are going to use drugs. Because contrary to what Nancy Reagan said, drugs do work. <laughs> You know, and, and, and some of the drugs that people use and, and end up having problems with, they were self-medicating for, they worked in the short run, they don't work in the long run, and we have to get people, when they're in circumstances like that, to change to a drug that works better for them. Instead of saying all drug use is bad, let's find what works for you. Alrighty, well... Thank everyone. I, I would. I want to add. Uh, I mentioned our our drop-in center. That's uh, 
going to open as of this Friday and that we're really going to be focusing on untraditional or non-traditional hours and weekends. Uh, we will be open seven days a week until 10 o'clock at night. We will be looking to collaborate heavily with other organizations so that because you know, we're in a position where because, again, we talked about developing those relationships with individuals and that we have a service offering that it will reach different populations and, and as we nurture those relationships, they become organic, just natural, a natural opportunity to make additional service referrals. Uh, in addition to making sure individuals have the tools necessary to stay safe uh, with whatever their primary choice or whatever it is they decide, we support their decisions. And again, just try to make sure that they are safe. There's a lot of people say, oh, Mark, you guys are opening a SIF? Uh, no, we're not opening a SIF. We have a low threshold drop in community center. We do go a couple of additional steps to, to make sure people are safe while they're there. But that's really what it comes down to is making sure people are safe. Uh, that, that's our mantra. So any, any last questions from the audience before we end? If not, uh, we really thank you for coming out, Tammy. Will the drop-in center provide? Yes. Go on, Tammy. Give us a sh give us a shout out. Go on. All right. We continue to do the OD prevention and trainings every Thursday night as well. And uh, at all times with the agency, Naloxone is free. We presently have three different administrations available, uh, intramuscular, Narcan intranasal, and FZO auto-injector, yes. <laughs> okay, so my staff is making sure you all know. Uh, again, thank you all for coming out. Ben, thank you for coming out. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you. Jay Stan McCauley, and uh, I do business as Light Source Productions. I provide professional services in the area of strategic video communications. Uh, first, what we do is we help you craft your message uh, using what I call the rule of the five W's, who, what, when, where, and why. We do event documentation, uh, content acquisition, full-scale productions, um, editing, and of course, distribution uh, through our social media television network. And with social media, uh, video is more important now than it has ever been. Uh, whether you're talking big business, small business, nonprofit, church, or just an individual. Uh, let's say you, you know you you plan a, a, you're planning an event, a wedding, whatever the case may be. But but let's say a big event, uh, but no video. And you spend all this time, all these hours, uh, to put this event on, and maybe a hundred, two hundred people attend the event. 
But more important than that is that thousands could attend by watching it on social media. But of course, you don't think about this until after the event is over. You can't afford not to capture it for social media. And despite what people think, I am affordable. Give me a call. Let's plan your next video project and share it with the world on my social media television network. I promise you that you will have the attention of one person, me.